Yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where we don't mind creeping about in the shadows with the men in black. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Our guest this time around is a blogger who goes by the name Recluse. He's one of the more impressive alternative bloggers in the game today. And after this one, you will know why. This is a bit of a unique episode because it's part one of a series Recluse and I have agreed to do with each other based on some blogs he's written about some of the lesser known and lesser discussed sources of power in times both past and present. Some of you have probably heard of the Catholic military order known as the Knights of Malta, and after this series, you'll know more about them than you'd ever want to know. What some of you probably haven't heard of is their connection to a host of other shadowy groups that have ties to governments, organized religions, banks, multinational corporations, intelligence agencies, killers for hire, and mafiosos across the world. This is the beginning of a story that brings together the church's historical interest in the occult, population control, and political subversion. It is, as Recluse has labeled it, a strange and terrible journey into the heart of the deep state. So let's slap on our critical thinking caps and prepare ourselves for that strange and terrible journey, because venturing into the shadows is necessary if you want to see the light. Enjoy! All right, so Recluse, really excited to have you here, man. Thanks for the time. That's nice to be here, Ryan. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. No problem. So I have to say, man, like I think you have one of the best blogs I've ever come across. I put you in the same class as a guy like Chris Knowles, who I'm sure you admire as well. But Yeah, I'm any- a huge, huge fan yeah. of Chris Knowles. It's, it's, yeah, it's very flowering, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. So... For anyone, though, who is unfamiliar with you and your work, tell us a bit about how you got started blogging and what sort of material people will find should they click on through to the other side. Well, I got started about uh, 2010, I believe. Yes, 2010, towards the end of 2010. And originally, Visup actually grew out of paranormal investigation uh, thing that me and my friend Chris were doing at the time. The blog was originally going to kind of be a supplement to that, and then there were some other topics, you know, that I had been compiling material on for a while that I sort of wanted to turn into essays, and after a couple of months, I mean, the paranormal thing really died out, but I had really enjoyed the blogging, and I decided to, you know, do a lot more with it, get into even more arcane topics and what have you. As for the stuff you find on there, uh, I would say that I, especially in the last couple of years, have really focused the end, or put the emphasis of the material I cover on a lot of right-wing extremism, esoteric Nazism, a lot of kind of uh, arcane topics like that that usually aren't covered extensively by a lot of conspiratorial blogs that are more into, I guess you would say, kind of the round table foundation, uh, Bilderberger group, you know, type uh, nexus. Yeah, that's exactly why you're here, is to talk about some of those more, like you said, arcane and lesser known conspiratorial groups and ideas, I guess. And the thing that we're going to, well, one of the things that we're going to talk a bit about, I guess one of the groups is the Knights of Malta and some other associated groups and ideas. But I'd like to preface this just a bit, so bear with me. I came across a documentary a while back piqued my interest in the Knights of Malta, but it was more geared towards their interest in alchemy, which we'll probably mention here shortly. But that documentary sent me down the uh, Maltese rabbit hole, or maybe down into the Maltese caves is a better way to describe that. And ultimately, that led me to your blog and this series you wrote called Men in Black, The Hidden History of the Knights of Malta. Or I, I guess it's just one post, and then it sort of spirals off into several other groups and stories. And I should note that I've done quite a bit of research about this myself, mostly related to the more fantastical alchemical stuff, and we may throw some of that out later, like I said. But for now, I guess the best place to start is the beginning. So tell us about the beginnings of the Knights of Malta. They were known under some different names first and, and weren't always associated with Malta, as it turns out, right? Oh, no, no, of course not. I mean, they had a uh, you know, pretty extensive history... The kind of uh, proto-version of the Knights of Malta actually had its origins in a hospital based in uh, Jerusalem that was founded sometime around the 7th century. Um, Basically, it was set up there by Christian pilgrims to treat other Christian pilgrims in the area. And it continued on fairly uneventfully until the 11th century when it was destroyed by the uh, Caliph al-Hakim. And uh, from there, there were efforts that were made to rebuild it in that century by the Benedictine Order. 
Now, uh, things really got going uh, when Blessed Gerard, we only really know him by that, Brother Gerard of the uh, Petition Brotherhood, took over the uh, hospital in the 1080s. And in retrospect, he was sort of credited with founding uh, what became known as the Hospital Order of uh, St. John of Jerusalem, which later became the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Rhodes, and so forth. Well, when I heard them in the, uh, mentioned in the documentary, they were called a, a much longer name. They were the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. And in the documentary, there's also a, a passing mention that they may have had Palestine in the title as well, but I couldn't find anything online about that. That Palestinian connection seems to have been scrubbed from history. Uh, no surprise there if you know anything about Palestine, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, and I should also point out, for the sake of the listener, we will refer to them as the Knights, the Knights of Malta. We also might call them the Hospitallers or the Knights of the Hospital at some point. So this is all the same group that we're talking about. Yes, and, yes they... Uh... I've definitely have had quite a few names over the years, very uh, elaborate, <laughs> some would say rather pompous. <laughs> definitely, for sure. So you mentioned Blessed Gerard. He is a key figure in the history of the Hospitallers. I was wondering if we had any more information on him. Yes, yes. Well, Gerard really first rose to prominence during the Siege of Jerusalem, uh, where he had tipped off the crusading knights that uh, were laying siege to it. He had given them information about the layout of the city, and the uh, defenses that the Muslims had raised for the siege. And that was generally considered to be instrumental in the success that the Crusaders had against the city. So kind of from the very beginning, in a lot of ways, I mean, the Knights did have a connection to intelligence gathering. I mean, certainly in that region of the world, you know, these kind of monasteries and the hospitals would have been one of the primary sources to gather information on the natives in that area, as there were not obviously, you know, a lot of other um, Christians, or at least European Christians in the area at the time and prior to the uh, beginning of the crusade. Yeah, and you did write, too, that it was not until Gerard's successor, and I hope I pronounced this guy's name right, is it Raymond Dupuy? Dupuy? I'm not sure how you say that guy's name, but... Yeah, we're definitely going to have some issues with some of the pronunciations (laughs) in here, but yeah, um, yeah, Dupuy works for me, um, but yes, yes, he is generally considered the one who actually militarized the order mm-hmm. and kind of in retrospect started to proclaim Blessed Gerard as the founder, even though they weren't exactly the, the knights at this point in time. They were primarily still just a hospitaller order. This was partly, of course, driven around the same time by the rise of the Knights of the Temple, uh, more commonly known as the Templar Knights, the Knights Templar. Um, they were, I guess, in some ways the predecessor crusading order, at least from a military perspective. And obviously somebody affiliated with the Order of St. John thought that it would be a good idea to add knights to the uh, network. Yeah, yeah. So the Templar connection is interesting, and we'll dig into that in a minute. I just wanted to back up. So you did mention that the Order's proto-history can be linked directly to intelligence gathering or espionage. What sort of spy games were they playing exactly? Do we have any idea? Not really. I mean, I haven't... I mean, obviously, there weren't really very extensive records kept during this time frame. So, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of that, uh, as far as I can tell, isn't especially known to history at the time. I mean, of course, they were a secretive order. I mean, uh, they haven't exactly published, I mean, a lot of their records, especially for some of the more nefarious activities, if you will, that they were involved in. So, as you will when you are a secret Catholic military order of some sort, you will develop a relationship at some point with the Holy Roman Empire. You've talked a bit about that in your blogs. You also mentioned that the Knights developed a relationship with the Habsburg dynasty. What were the details of those relationships? Well, the relationship with the Holy Roman Empire started in the 12th century when they received patronage from Frederick Baropa, let's just say, who was one of the most prominent (laughs) Holy Roman emperors of the Middle Ages. And the connection to the Habsburgs started to begin in earnest in the 16th century. The island of Malta was actually granted to them by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, after they had been driven off of uh, the island of Rhodes. And from the 17th century onward, the Grand Masters of the Knights were made rank first, which is a prince of the Holy Roman Empire. And of course, the connection with the Habsburg dynasty really continued in a lot of ways into the modern era with the kind of European secret network uh, that's variously known as the Nay Circle or Le Cercle, which received a lot of patronage for a good part of the 20th century from Otto von Habsburg, the uh, last crown prince of Austria. 
And, of course, the Cirque was very heavily dominated by Knights of Malta in the early years. And uh, as I've tried to explain it to readers before on my blog, it was sort of the international rights answer to the Bilderberger Group in kind of a simplistic term, though it was a much more drawn from the ranks of various intelligence agencies and military officers and uh, religious orders the world over, rather, from the, uh, rather than from the business community, which is usually where Bilderberger recruited from. So if you had to guess then, what would the benefits of this relationship be for both sides? You know, like what would the, the Knights of Malta get out of this arrangement? What would the, the Roman Empire get out of it? What would the Habsburgs get out of it? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, the Knights of Malta had a vast, you know, connection around the world. I mean, that would be something that the Habsburg dynasty uh, would have found very useful. I mean, they would have been something of a military auxilia at times for them. And then on the flip side of the coin, the Habsburg dynasty has always been very wealthy also with the prestige of it as well. So there was kind of a mutual beneficial relationship in that regard where the influence of the Habsburgs and say nothing of their you know, money was a great benefit to the Maltese Knights. And then on the other hand, the Knights themselves were able to provide military assistance, intelligence, and other things like that to the Holy Roman Emperor. I pulled a quote out here. This is going to speak to the Templar connection that we mentioned a couple minutes ago. But you wrote that in the Holy Lands, the Order frequently rubbed shoulders with two darlings of conspiracy literature, the Knights Templar and the Nazari, I think that's how you say that, who are more commonly referred to as the Assassins or the Hashashins, I think. (laughs) So, uh, Hashashians. Hashashians. Okay, that's a whatever. So, as to the latter, to the Assassins, it would appear that the Hospitaller and the Nazari established a relationship so close by the late 13th century that it reportedly bordered on heresy. So, I mean, I've always been particularly fond of heresy. I I found it to be pretty sexy, but what sort of heresy are we talking about here specifically? Something tells me it goes beyond just questioning the official church narrative. A biggest concern, I would say, or at least the most immediate concern, would have been militarily. The um, Hessians began paying tribute to the Maltese Knights in the 12th century, and uh, shortly thereafter, both you know groups began to support each other in battle. And in some cases, the uh, Maltese Knights had even supported the Hessians against other Latin Crusader states in that region of the world. So this was obviously quite a concern. And even then, obviously, the reputation of the Nizarillo was quite colorful, to put it mildly, and many of the warring factions of crusaders played off upon that reputation and their condemnations of the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John, whatever, to the Pope for aligning themselves with this particular order. So how are you saying that word? Was it I Nizari? believe it's Nizaria. I'm not 100% sure. Nizaria, something like that. But <laughs> yes, like I said, we're going to have some problems with some pronunciations here and there across the series. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. That's totally cool. I'm just going to call them the Assassins then. Okay, so, let's go with the Assassins. Let's go with the Assassins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the Assassins uh, are worth a quick tangent here. Uh, here's a quote from you about them. Over the years, there has been much speculation over the Assassins, who became infamous throughout Christian and Islamic lands during the Middle Ages for their curious ability to assassinate heads of state, hence the reason why the word Assassin derives from Hashashians. Frequently, these assassinations occurred in broad daylight and in crowded places where the assassin had no chance to escape after the deed was done. As such, it was common for an assassin to die immediately after taking out their target. So, you also mentioned in your blog that the CIA referenced this group in an early assassination manual. So, I guess my question is, what's an assassination manual and why would the CIA have one? And why would they be referencing this ancient assassin order in it? Well, um, obviously, I mean, the CIA has dealt with a lot of assassinations over the years. I mean, that kind of went back to the OSS days and the kind of black ops with that type of thing. So, I mean, there were methods that had been studied, you know, some of which had been used in World War II for assassinations. A lot of the assassination manual in particular that you're referencing also came out during the era when Artichoke and MK Ultra were starting to get off the ground. And obviously, the historical myths surrounding the assassins would have been intriguing in that regard, as they were long perceived as being able to have created programmed assassins that could kill essentially without feeling towards their own fate. And obviously, this was an alleged goal of the MK Ultra and the Artichoke projects. And to some extent, I mean, you can see how some of these methods were probably later incorporated into some long suspected cults that had ties to the U.S. intelligence community, especially the Unification Church uh, would come to mind, which was run by Sun Myung Moon. 
uh, contrary to a lot of the you know perception that people have of the assassins, there doesn't appear to be a lot of evidence that drug use was used uh, in the early days when they were at their peak as an assassination squad under Hassan I. Sabah. If it did happen, and that's obviously highly debated, especially by many Islamic scholars, but if it did happen, it came later on, usually under associated under the reign of Hassan's grandson, Hassan II, who led the sect into a declining period, to put it mildly. But anywho, uh, the original Hasten had really emphasized aesthetic living. It was, uh, I believe, in one account, if I remember correctly, he had even had his own son executed for drinking wine. He often encouraged fasting. He tried to get his followers to have as little sleep as possible, and they were, of course, relentlessly indoctored in his particular faith over and over again throughout the course of their lives. And um, again, you know, these are methods that were later adopted a lot by the Unification Church, the People's Temple, and these kinds of peculiar religious organizations began to spring up and gain prominence in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, okay, so that whole thing, this uh, assassination in broad daylight and then the assassin dying afterward, uh, I mean, we know of some rather recent assassinations that seem to fit that description, don't we? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, to some extent, but I mean, it is important to kind of emphasize with the assassins, their targets were pretty much always principally heads of state. They really didn't kill common people the way that has really become the kind of modus operandi of terrorism in the modern era, which I would say is definitely a distinction uh, between the two. But in the other case, yes, I mean, it certainly follows, I mean, a similar track where you've conditioned somebody to be willing to go out and kill and accept the consequences of that, which frequently are death immediately afterward. Well, yeah, I mean, I was thinking of, you know, something like the JFK event. That seems to sort of fit that. Well, yes, yes, yeah. yes, that would be one I could see. So in that case, of course, there's a lot of debate as to whether the actual assassins, um, right. yeah, escaped that or not. <laughs> well, yeah, it was so weird because you had, I mean, you had, you had Oswald get shot like the next day, right? You know, yeah, this... quite a few of the participants, uh, or witnesses, I should say, to the Kennedy assassination did die in the years following it uh, in quite staggering numbers. Yeah, and this is an interesting parallel to draw already. You know, some of the early players in the CIA, like Alan Dulles, had connections to the Knights of Malta or were members of the Order. And if the Knights were, you know, palling around with the Assassins and the Knights Templars in years past, you can see why those references and those connections to American intelligence would exist, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So beyond this, the Assassins and some other groups in the Holy Land were engaged in more esoteric practices. And here you mentioned the Yazidis, the Mandeans, the Sufis, and the Druze, which I had not heard of, and also the Haran Sabians. Did I say that one right? I believe so, Haran. Yes, yes, I believe that's how it was pronounced. Yeah, yeah the Sabians are a very um, interesting sect. The kind of mainline ones were considered uh, people of the book. In Islamic custom, they're generally believed now to have been an offshoot of the Mandians, and hence they might have been more of a Johnite kind of Gnostic sect. But the Iranian Sabians were had originated from Syria, and they had a much different dogma than the more mainline Sabians. In fact, it's generally believed that they probably only adapted the Sabian name in the first place to avoid uh, persecution in the Holy Land. But eventually, they uh, followed an ideology that was very much based around the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus, and uh, essentially, they preserved Hermeticism almost uh, totally intact up through the Middle Ages until they were expelled from Baghdad in the 11th century. And there's a general belief by some scholars that the origins of alchemy in the Islamic world might have originated to some extent from the Sabians in this particular era. In reference to the Knights of Malta, there's the Syria connection to all of the. This is where the particular branch of the Assassins was located that the Knights of Malta had the uh, biggest dealing with, and there has been some speculation, well, maybe the Sabians returned to Syria after they were expelled from Baghdad. And, of course, you had, I mean, the Nizaria in that area, you had, uh, I believe, the Druze and some other of these kind of heretic arcane sects that were wandering in the area at the time. You mentioned that the Sabians had a had a reverence for Hermes Trismegistus, and this obviously would be where they had an interest in alchemy, which you wrote about. You actually said that the Sabians were one of the key conduits to transfer Hermeticism from the ancient world to the Middle Ages, which you mentioned. They were also reported to be early alchemists as well. So when it comes to alchemy, I mentioned that documentary that I was watching that, that had referenced the Knights and their interest in alchemy. Do you know anything more about that from your research? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, some of the information on Manuel Pinto, which I'm sure you're referencing to in the documentary, and um, mm-hmm. his alleged relationship with, uh, was it Cagliostro, I believe? Yeah. Yes, uh, so obviously, I mean, uh, Pinto was certainly known as a prominent alchemist in the time, and I mean, he embarked upon many projects, uh, why he was Grand Master of the Maltese Knights for much of the 18th century. And then there was another um, interesting connection that I actually stumbled upon today when I was doing some notes for this uh, interview. Another member of the Maltese Knights, uh, Antonio Medici, uh, Medici, I believe is how it's pronounced, Medici, mm-hmm. a prominent Italian banking dynasty who had dominated Florence for many hundreds of years. He uh, had actually been forced into the Knights of Malta by his family as part of some internal intrigues there. But apparently he had uh, considered or he had pursued his interest in alchemy why he was a member of the Maltese Knights for many years. And in that context, the uh, Medici family is very interesting because they have been the sponsors of the Platonic Academy in Florence, uh, beginning in the Renaissance. It's sometimes also known as the Florentine Academy, and that was where a lot of the most prominent alchemists of the Renaissance had studied. And Florence, of course, for that reason, has a very fabulous esoteric history. Some of the other groups that I think people would be familiar with that we mentioned, you know, the Yazidi and the Mandeans and the Sufis, do you have any idea what sort of influence they may have had on the Knights of Malta? Well, I mean, again, it's obviously very, very speculative, but I do tend to feel that there was some kind of at least theory of Gnosticism that may have been promoted among these, you know, different sects that was possibly uh, picked up upon by the Knights of Malta and some of these other Christian crusaders. You know, in a really sort of very speculative theory on my part, but um, the earliest reports of Satanism in Europe actually date from about the 13th, 14th century, which is around the time that the Crusades had begun to break out. And in some instances, you can kind of think of Satanism as sort of a Christian heresy, as it's essentially an inversion of a Christian mass, at least in terms of the black mass or a mockery of it. And, of course, in the case of, say, the Yizdis, I mean, they were generally referred to as devil worshippers in the Middle East uh, during that era. So, who knows, you know, some of these knights had heard rumblings about this, you know, kind of Gnostic faith that was practiced by the Yizdis and the Druze and some of these other groups, but they were not able to access any of the holy scriptures or anything of that nature, so they had to essentially wing it and come up with something that was based on a rough knowledge that they had of Gnosticism. And I mention that in the context of the Knights of Malta, because when you get into the modern era with a group like Le Cercle, which I had mentioned earlier, there are a lot of reports of these very bizarre occult practices that have been described as satanic among the uh, upper echelon of this group. And so it does kind of raise some interesting questions about what, you know, the Knights might have possibly learned while they were in that region of the world during that era. Yeah, and we mentioned the Knights Templar earlier. And I mean, that's another one where, again, you know, there's been a lot of speculation with the Templar faith at this time, too, and what exactly they picked up upon when they were in the Holy Land. They have an interesting relationship because in some places it's it's sort of a rivalry. You sort of get that feel that they're that they're sort of feuding against each other on some level. Yes, uh, I mean, and of course the Knights of Malta benefited tremendously from the uh, suppression of the Templars as they were able to acquire much of the Templars' properties around the world. So the suppression in and of itself, I mean, made the Knights of Malta, I mean, phenomenally wealthy and powerful, even more so than they had already been. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was actually. Uh, Pope Clement V suggested that they be merged into one order, which fits the accounts that I've read. You mentioned that in your blog, too. And uh, it was suggested that they go by the name of, of the Knights of Jerusalem, and their leader would be known as the War King. Why the <laughs> fuck that would be, I don't know. I had <laughs> never heard that one. That is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just love that history shows us that war is waged by people who are supposedly men of God. Regardless, you know, the Hospitallers, the the Knights of Malta, like you said, do seem to have effectively absorbed everything Templar, you know, like their wealth, their land, just everything that they would have had access to or owned, it seems to have just been absorbed by the Knights of Malta. And we know that the Templars were known to have amass this vast fortune too, right? It's one of those, you know, cool, like fun, entry-level conspiracy stories like the Templar treasure, right? So Yes, the missing Templar treasure, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, it might not be missing anymore. It might just be in the hands of Knights of Malta, right? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as I say, I mean, if... Certainly. 
I mean, yeah, certainly they've been accumulating. I mean, a lot of these kind of arcane orders over the years, which, I mean, is certainly led to some probably some interesting secrets being passed down. Another one that I hadn't really um, gotten into in the blog yet, as I had meant to eventually do, you know, obviously a second part to it, but it was the the uh, Brotherhood of St. Anthony. St. Anthony, that's mm-hmm. right, that's right. Which is another hospital order that had kind of developed out of the Holy Land to um, treat St. Anthony's fire, which was rye poisoning, uh, which had led to hallucinations. And of course, as I'm sure many of the listeners are aware, this was one of the kind of inspirations eventually for LSD. And there had been a lot of theories over the years that the Brotherhood was aware of the, well, obviously they were aware of the psychedelic properties of this poisoning, but they had intentionally um, cultivated doses of it to have mystical experiences. And this was an order that the Knights of Malta, I believe, had taken over in the either 17th or 18th century. So, you know, once again, there was probably some very interesting secrets that the Brothers of St. Anthony possessed that the Knights of Malta ended up controlling. Yeah, and I don't have all my notes in front of me for for this bit, but for my own research, I mean, but the Knights of Malta's connection to what we would call, you know, kind of modern day pharmacology, like they have connections to how that that industry sort of was formed. And I, I don't know if it goes back to that the Brotherhood of St. Anthony, because, you know, they seem to have been really into, like, learning about the the early effects of ergot poisoning, and then you have the Knights' sort of uh, natural interest in alchemy, which, you know, leads to chemistry and leads to pharmacology, too, maybe on some level. So, yeah, there's a lot of, it, of interesting connections here, and I just wanted to go back to the uh, absorption of the Knights Templar real quick, too. If the Knights of Malta have absorbed the Knights Templar, you know, their land and their their wealth and their treasure... We've seen a tremendous shift in power here, you know, kind of behind the scenes in this, you know, I I guess what you would call the the black market of that time period. And this also is sort of, we could make a, like an analogy here in modern day. It seems very similar to these giant corporate mergers that you see now, like Bear buying Monsanto or Dow and DuPont merging, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a certain air of the merger to all of this, and um, I mean, how a lot of this sort of arcane knowledge is consolidated in the hands of fewer and few through these processes. And I suppose in a way you could kind of draw a parallel to the modern tech industry as well. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I think any sort of modern, you know, corporate merger or buyout would be very akin to this sort of transfer of power here. So there's an interesting character that that gets involved here at some point named Ramon Lull. He's been mentioned on the podcast, I think, once or twice. haven't really dug into who he was, but he does have some involvement here. What can you tell us about him? He was one of the proponents initially of merging the Order of the Knights of the Templar and the Knights of Malta together, and obviously he was one of the earliest alchemists. So yes, yes, he was an early patron of the Knights of Malta. Let's see, I believe he was a member of one of the uh, other Catholic orders. And also, the analogy of Hiram Abiff that you find in Freemasonry comes into play here, too. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, one of the theories put forth, I don't know if it was initially by John J. Robinson or not, but I'm guessing that's probably where many people uh, encountered it, dealt with the uh, three murderers of Hiram Abiff, the unworthy craftsmen, so to speak. And in Robinson's interpretation, it was believed that these three ruffians were stand-ins for the church, the state and the mob. Now, obviously, Pope Clement would have come in, or that was at least one common interpretation. Robinson differentiated a bit in that he believed that the Knights of Malta had been one of the uh, ruffians along with the church, i.e. symbolized by Pope Clement, and also King Philip of France, who uh, was in place of the mob. You actually wrote that this is in stark contrast to much conspiracy literature, which tends to depict the Knights of Malta as lackeys of the Freemasons. I mean, absolutely. Because, um, yes, I mean, in general, I mean, the Knights of Malta were who were left standing, I mean, after the Templars. And it does seem that for many years afterwards, when the Masonic lodges became kind of open around the 17th century, they were used to infiltrate them. So, uh, yes, and then, of course, Albert Mackey uh, has written extensively on this topic in his various encyclopedias on Masonic topics, and he is also pretty adamant about the opposition that the Knights of Malta had against the Freemasons. The rest of that, that quote you do mention Mackey here is, there is little evidence of this, however, that the Knights were lackeys of the Freemasons. The Scottish Rite degree, named after the Knights of Malta, appears to reflect the take of John J. Robinson, whose work you quoted, but it reflected his take on the Maltese Knights as assassins, 
while still showing a certain admiration for the order and famed 19th century Freemason Albert Mackey, who you mentioned, in his encyclopedia of masonry proclaimed that the Maltese Knights to be long-standing foes of the Masons. So that is, when you dig into the conspiracy literature, like you said, it does sort of reflect these ideas that the Maltese Knights were sort of like underlings almost of the Freemasons, but really they were sort of kind of enemies, weren't they? Kind of enemies, and I mean, also, I would say, sort of their own power as well. And then, of course, also, I mean, you could kind of go into the sort of division in Europe as well. The Maltese Knights typically had their power base in Italy and uh, much of Southern Europe, which was Catholic, whereas the stronghold of the Masons were typically in England and the other Protestant countries in the north. So, I mean, there was also sort of that dynamic as well that I think is somewhat underrated. Definitely, yeah. So this actually takes us to the end of this first blog entry that you wrote about the hidden history of the Knights of Malta. And just to quote your own recap here, the Knights of Malta emerged during the Crusades and spent nearly two centuries roaming the Holy Lands. There they likely encountered a host of esoteric ideologies and they're suspected to have adopted some type of of esoteric doctrine derived from some combination of all these groups that we just mentioned. The Templars are then suppressed and persecuted in Europe with the Knights Hospitaller ending up with their properties, members, and possibly whatever occult doctrines the Templars subscribe to. Certainly this more than echoes modern encounters of men in black who perform a similar function in regards to UFO revelations. And that's where the title of your blog series comes from, you know, Men in Black, The Hidden History of the Knights of Malta. Explain to the folks, though, what you mean exactly by the Men in Black reference here. How is this similar? That was actually a concept that I had picked up from uh, Alan uh, Greenfield, who's an interesting kind of a cult writer. But essentially, he had argued that by the early 20th century, the uh, Knights of Malta had sort of become the figurehead, I guess, for a kind of international black order that, among other things, had been involved in suppressing a lot of these kind of esoteric and arcane traditions. And this is something that you can kind of see going back to the suppression of the uh, Templar Knights, you know, in the Middle Ages, and then continuing on through the absorption of the Brotherhood of St. Anthony and some of these other orders. You know, as we've kind of talked about, I mean, a lot over this part on the Knights of Malta here, I mean, there were a lot of these arcane ideals that the uh, Knights encountered in the Holy Land and then later in Europe that, you know, were likely absorbed into the order and have been kept very secretive for many years afterward. Yeah, so is it safe to say then that the Knights Templar may have wanted to, you know, make these occult and esoteric doctrines accessible to the public at large through their lodges, you know, which makes sense because if the Knights Templar did sort of inspire Freemasonry, the guys that I know that are in Freemasonry, you know, just just normal folks are all about, you know, sharing occult and esoteric wisdom. So if the Knights Templar had that same mission, uh, the Knights of Malta obviously contrasted that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I think you can definitely see that in the structures of the two organizations. I mean, a lot, of course, is written about the objectives of the Freemasons, but um, I mean, I think really a big part of why they loaded to prominence, especially in the United States in the 19th and early 20th century, is because essentially they were able to bring together people in the lodges of very different social standings. And for this reason, I mean, really, by the early 20th century, they had become essentially a good old boys network in the United States. A lot a lot of people frequently joined Masonic lodges for the sole purpose of their advancement of their social status. Obviously, this became, you know, rather riddled by cronism in the latter period, but in the early days, it was definitely a rather revolutionary concept to have common laborers initiated into this brotherhood with men of means and status, and in theory, to have a certain degree of equality imposed upon them. Of course, in practice, you know, it didn't always work out that way, but there was a kind of vaguely democratic concept to masonry that I do think had a, you know, positive influence on some levels. Now, by contrast, the Knights of Malta are purely an aristocratic organization. I mean, really, for many years, you had to be of noble blood to even be initiated into the order. They've changed that somewhat in recent years, but generally speaking, you're you're only going to get in if you are an aristocrat or extremely rich. It's definitely an exclusively an elite order and something that normal people have no chance of ever being a part of. And, you know, that's really always been the case throughout their history. Definitely, yeah. So we're going to transition now into a couple other blog entries that that do relate here, but it is going to take us down a a bit of a different rabbit hole, I guess. Uh, This series that you wrote is called Propaganda do uh, a strange and terrible journey into the heart of the deep state. I guess we'll start with the link between Freemasonry and the Knights of Malta. You know, that's a curious and misleading one. You wrote that 
In recent years, the linkage between the Knights of Malta and Freemasonry has been revived by no less than Pope Francis himself, who has demanded that the Maltese Knights purge Freemasons from their ranks. But we are overlooking one key detail here, and it has to do with the famous P2 Lodge, uh, I think it was in Rome, right? Uh, no, actually, uh, the lodge was based out of Turin in northern Italy. And this sort of brings back to some of the uh, topics we addressed earlier. Uh, it seems like most of Gelli, uh, Lucio Gelli, the uh, nominal grand master of P2, most of his operations were based out of, I believe it is pronounced Rizzo, which is in Tuscany, and it's approximately uh, 50 miles south of Florence, which, as I had noted before, was home of the Platonic Academy, where many of the leading alchemists of the Renaissance mm-hmm. trained at, and also the long-standing home of the Medici family that had had some ties to the Knights of Malta and were also themselves very prominent alchemists. And also of interest in the modern era is the fact that the uh, Munster of Florence killings were also occurring in Florence, obviously, in the 1970s and the 1980s when Gelli was at the peak of his operational prowess. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but the Munster of Florence is, I suppose, in some way, uh, at least kind of version of Jack the Ripper. They were a series of murders committed against young couples in those mm-hmm. two decades. And nowadays, it's generally believed that more than one killer was involved, and there was, to some extent, a bit of uh, similarity to the Sum and Sam murders, where young couples were essentially found parked in cars in isolated areas, and typically they were shot uh, at close range, and then the female was usually mutilated. And there's been a a lot of theories as to the dates and what have you that they were killed on and um, some of the mutilations that were done having significant occult uh, significance. That's interesting, man. I had not heard of that, no. Yeah, and that so kind of the... corresponds as well as uh, with the years of lead in Italy, which was just generally speaking a time mm-hmm. of intense terror campaigns that uh, at the time were largely blamed on the communist groups there, but which a lot of investigations in recent years have proven were actually carried out by the Italian secret services and many right-wing groups with D2 being one of the leading organizations used for these operations. So, I mean, it's also very interesting in that context that while Gilly is apparently, uh, you know, in communication with many leading fascist terrorists that were carrying out various attacks around the country, there's also this mysterious serial killer operating some 50 or so miles from his villa that obviously was uh, very distressing to the Italian populace in this time as well. Yeah. Back to the lodge then that, that we mentioned. You mentioned P2. This lodge is, is known as Propaganda Due. <laughs> That's uh, where the P2 comes from. Uh, Due meaning two in Italian and uh, propaganda being a key part of this too, actually. But P2 is fascinating to me for a lot of reasons, uh, which we'll get to. But as far as the relationship between the P2 Lodge and the Knights of Malta go, what was the nature of that and how did it develop at first? Again, the leading figure who's generally believed to have been the controlling figure in the day-to-day operations of P2 was a figure known as, God help me in pronouncing this, <laughs> Umberto Ortolena, who was also a member of the Inner Council of the Maltese Knights and uh, was also a secret chamberlain for the Vatican household. He was very, very close to various popes and extremely well-connected in the Vatican hierarchy. And eventually, he had initiated Gelli himself into the Maltese Knights as well. And even though there's been a lot of debate as to whether or not he was a member or not, a guiding force behind P2 was the Italian Prime Minister, Andorati, I believe is how it's pronounced. He was also a member of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. And as to how this all came about, Gelli reports that in the, I believe, late 60s or early 70s, he was he was approached by General Alexander Haig to become involved in P2, which was likely an extension of what is known as Operation Gladio, which was essentially a program run by the Pentagon and the CIA to sort of amass the resistance forces, quote-unquote, uh, in Italy and across many of the other uh, European states and the alliance who could be used in the event of a communist invasion to rage a guerrilla war against the Soviets, so there's been a lot of speculation that, in fact, these forces were used for terror attacks. But anywho, getting back to the matter at hand, Haig was himself a member of the Sovereign Military of Order of Malta. He gave Gelly the green light to get involved with the P2 proposition, and uh, from there on out, many other leading uh, Maltese knights became involved with P2 in executive levels. Yeah, so, you know, this is this is an interesting thing to me, because P2, 
it's a Freemasonic lodge, and we can get into whether it really was or not later. But it, it, it for all intents and purposes, it is. And this is maybe my favorite bit from this because it explains so much. You wrote, "This is compelling, but I suspect there was another motive to give a yet another black eye to a long-standing foe of the Order, the Knights of Malta." P2 has provided much fodder to conspiracy researchers obsessed with Masons, uh, virtually all of them, (laughs) who in turn almost totally ignore the dominating influence the Maltese Knights had over P2. In many ways, it would be difficult for a reactionary Catholic order to come up with a more perfect cover. And goddamn, if that isn't spot on, dude. I mean, there are folks obsessed with Masonic symbolism and involvement in these uh, quote-unquote terrorist attacks or false flag events, as uh, they're known in more conspiratorial circles. But this does explain it perfectly. You know, most of the Knights of Malta were or are members of the Freemasonic P2 Lodge, and the Knights are also connected to intelligence agencies across the world, which we outlined earlier. So with all their money, all their power, all their resources, all their data, all their intel, they could definitely carry out these events for their own gain and then throw some Masonic symbols around in the media footage and wherever else. And then, you know, the more conspiracy-minded researchers or even just regular folks who are hip to this stuff, they'll look at this, they'll look at these events and they'll say, well, those Freemasons are at it again causing trouble. But the Knights of Malta sort of, you know, commandeering the symbols and using them so they themselves don't get any heat. I hate to say it, but it's a brilliant way to fool and misdirect the masses and we can't put it past them because if you think false flag events are real... You know, if you think one group is carrying out some secret or sinister hidden agenda and then blaming it on other groups, then, you know, why wouldn't they also sort of symbolically do the same thing? Well, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I do think that there was, uh, you know, that was very much, I mean, a uh, reason for using the propaganda uh, lodge in the first place. And of course, I should preface by saying, too, that this P2 wasn't the only propaganda lodge that was involved in this network. There was also a P1, which was located in France, and P3, which was located in Madrid. And, of course, Spain and France are still largely Catholic countries, especially Spain. So, yes, I mean, there does seem to have been this kind of network of very reactionary uh, Catholics who were, you know, overtly using these Masonic lodges to, you know, wage some very nefarious activities, and it was a fabulous cover and also, as um, the great Robert Hutchinson has written in uh, their Kingdom Come and Expose of Opus Dei, there was a sense, I think, to some extent among these Catholic groups that by using the Masons and also organized crime figures, you were kind of doing the dirty work and using unclean hands to do it, quote-unquote, as opposed to, uh, you know, dragging the actual Catholic organizations into it. I'm curious, then, in your research, is there a specific reason they chose the word propaganda for these lodges? I mean, it seems a little too obvious. I mean, it is. I don't know if it was maybe a play on the Masonic concept of a hoodwink or something to that effect. I'm not really, yeah, I'm not really sure why exactly propaganda was picked for the name of these, of this, you know, section of lodges. It is very strange. Also, as I've written about in a couple of blogs, uh, apparently within the P2 Lodge, they refer to themselves as, okay, this is also going to be something I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pronunciation on, uh, Fredelia Neria. And this is apparently Italian for Black Friars. And for those of you who have followed Propaganda Do conspiracy theories, the Vatican banker uh, Roberto Calvia, who was very close to both um, the Maltese Knights and P2, died mysteriously in the early 80s. His body was found daggling from a bridge in England that was called Blackfriars Bridge. Mm. And um, for me, the significance of that kind of goes into a fascist organization originating in France prior to the Second World War that was known as the Claglieu or something to that effect. I'm going to sake of further embarrassing myself, refer to it by its English name, which would be the Hood. Anyway, the Hood was a proto-fascist group that was operational in France prior to the Second World War and to some extent early in the Second World War before the Nazi regime suppressed it. But anywho, um, later on, some of the members of this organization became involved with Le Cercle, which also had ties to P2. So it has kind of dawned on me that there might have been this kind of strange occult practices that were passed down in that fashion. Uh, If you look up some of the images online of um, the regalia that the P2 members wore in the meeting of their lodges, they are very strange, and they are most assuredly not the type of thing that you would see in most Masonic lodges. Essentially, it could be described as a black Klansman's outfit, (laughs) and this was similar to the hoods that uh, the hood wore 
in France as well. And there's also been some accounts that the rather notorious hypnotist William Joseph Bryan, who in some accounts was who hypnotized Saran, Saran to uh, commit Robert Kennedy's assassination, was also involved with an arcane church group that wore a similar outfit. So I've seen quite a few reports of this, you know, very strange regalia that have been used by some of these fascist-leaning uh, occult groups, which unfortunately has never really been addressed by a researcher with the means and contacts to really track down some of the leads on it. But it's, it's very strange, and certainly it seems to indicate that while P2 did have some heavy occult leanings beyond their deep stake intrigues that are often focused upon. It was definitely not the type of thing you would encounter in a conventional Masonic Lodge. That's a good segue, because you wrote that uh, P2 is a staple of Masonic conspiracy literature, although much of said literature is of little value in understanding the true aims and masters of P2. P2 was many things, but a conventional Masonic Lodge, it was not. So if it wasn't that, what was it exactly? Well, I mean, I think superficially, I mean, it was used as a control mechanism in Italy, of course, part of the process of being initiated into P2, and P2 almost exclusively targeted, you know, uh, captains of industry, members of the Italian secret services and so forth for membership, and part of their initiation required them to bring in blackmail material and turn it over to P2 on friends and associates of theirs that could be used to bring political pressure to bear. And then conversely, there's also a lot of compelling evidence that P2 was also involved in a lot of the terror attacks that were carried out in Italy. So it seems to have served, at least in part, as a control mechanism for a crucial U.S. ally in Europe, uh, on the one hand, to blackmail the ruling elite to ensure that they would comply with U.S. demands, and then on the other hand, to terrorize the populace at large and to generally create a, an atmosphere of anti-communism. Yeah, you wrote that P2 has been described as a parallel or shadow government of Italy, and during its heyday there was much merit to this claim, but P2's activities were not restricted to Italy. It was an international organization with branches all across Europe and the Americas, and its contacts were impeccable. The U.S., or, or sorry, the intelligence services of the U.S., USSR, and various other European governments, as well as various politicians and, and organized crime figures spanning either bloc. So, do we have any idea how they're operating in these other countries? Under what names? Are they infiltrating other Masonic lodges in these countries, especially here in the States? Well, I mean, it's noted, um, obviously, you know, you had the P1 and P3 lodges in um, France and Spain, respectively, that openly operated under those names. Uh, in Argentina, I believe they also operated under the Propaganda Do banner and had branches of the P2 lodge in that section of the world. In the States, I mean, it was primarily through a lot of their contacts and the intelligence services, especially as I've noted before, Alexander Haig. Uh, there's some speculation that William Casey might have been involved in some of these intrigues. Uh, Vernon Walters, another sovereign military order of Malta member who was close to the Reagan administration, might have been a contact. Probably the most direct would have been through Lip Circle, which, again, you know, had very extensive ties to the American intelligence, American secret services. So, I mean, yes, there is, you know, I mean, kind of a vague outline of how they operated. Uh, but generally speaking, it seems like the U.S. intelligence services had established these kind of quasi-Masonic lodges with their allies in the Sovereign Military Order of Malta and Opus Dei across uh, much of Western Europe and the allied countries to kind of dominate the national political climate to ensure that they stayed in the U.S. alliance. And this was also very true, I would say, for the Americas as well, especially in South America. Yeah, so <laughs> you then wrote that, uh, you know, this is only scratching the surface of P2's shadowy deeds. If anybody can believe that we've only scratched the surface, well, I mean, we really have. But to continue to quote you, you said, Indeed, one of the most daunting tasks that comes with chronicling P2 is determining an appropriate place to start for the Lodge's history. The best I could come up with is the Lodge's alleged master, the infamous Lysio Gelli, who we mentioned. Gelli was likely little more than a puppet himself, but his history and that of P2 are so closely entwined that one cannot be understood without addressing the other. So let's try to understand a bit about Gelly. You know, you mentioned he was the first Grandmaster. How did the Lodge begin exactly? Propaganda Do was originally known as Propaganda Masonica, I believe, and it was, I think, founded as far back in the 19th century. Uh, it was suppressed during the World, uh, Second World War by Mussolini, and then it had become operational in the wake of the Second World War after Italy was liberated, but it was really not very prominent until Gelly took over. 
at some point in the 1960s. It seemed like the lodge was largely destitute, and as such, it was easy for him to come in there and assume control of the operation and then use it for his own purposes. Uh, Gelly, of course, you know, has a very interesting history. He had been a black shirt uh, for Mussolini prior to the Second World War and continued to support him throughout the World War. Later on, Gelly also collaborated with the communists somewhat uh, afterwards probably to avoid uh, being uh, killed in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War when there were a lot of openness, open communist groups operational in Italy. Through these groups, he also had developed contacts in the Eastern Bloc, which he probably used later on for drugs and arm trafficking during the Ira whole Iran-Contra era. So, I mean, he did have those contacts to the East as well, uh, and then also he became involved with the rat lines in uh, the wake of the Second World War, in which many Nazi war criminals were funneled out of Europe, frequently into South America. So the guy definitely traveled around, and he had already had very impeccable contacts and in various intelligence services by the 1950s. When does he make contact or make a relationship with the Vatican then? Is there any breadcrumbs there? I would say it probably dated uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, and it seems like this actually was related to his contact with Opus Dei. Reportedly, he had encountered the founder, um, Jose Maria Escarva, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, in that time frame, and he became involved in the rat lines in Spain in uh, that time frame and helped smuggle out many Nazi war criminals, and it would seem that um, some elements of the Vatican were impressed with his work. We mentioned Opus Dei uh, several times here, and you know they were sort of thrust into mainstream culture many years ago when they were mentioned in the Da Vinci Code book and movie, of all things. So what is Opus Dei exactly, and you know how do they connect to this story that we're trying to tell here? Well, Opus Dei was a, is a religious order that was founded, I believe, in the 1920s in Spain, uh, it really rose to prominence during Franco's takeover, and um, by the end of the Second World War, it seems to have become involved with U.S. intelligence operations to smuggle out uh, Nazi war criminals, and that really led to its rise as a major international power. And um, I've seen reports that Opus Dei was frequently the organization that was used by the United States intelligence community to erect the kind of Gladio network that we talked about earlier across Europe. They were probably, uh, from what my research has indicated, one of the chief partners along with the Maltese Knights and in the case of Propaganda Do, which, you know, was obviously a very key component of Gladio in Italy. Both factions were well represented in the case of Open Sky. That came a lot from the uh, bankers that were involved with P2, specifically uh, Roberto Calvia and Cardinal Paul Markenkos, who was the head of the Vatican Bank at the time. Both of them were very close to Opus Dei, and they also were involved in procuring funds for P2 for their various activities, which, uh, among other things, involved arms smuggling. You mentioned the Vatican Bank there, and we mentioned Gladio, and you know, there's, just, there's just a lot of, of interesting events that P2 is sort of connected with, but I, I think the Vatican banking scandal deserves a couple of minutes here. How are they involved in that? Well, specifically, it seems that uh, Calvia was being pressed to um, funnel money out of Banco Ambrosia, the bank that he oversaw. And yes, that's Ambrosia is in the... Um I believe it was the Greek phrase for the nectar of the gods or something to that effect. Uh, but anywho, he had been funneling funds out that were used to arm up um, some of the death squads in South America, and eventually that led to a, liquid, a liquidity crisis for Banco Ambrosia, and that later dragged the Vatican Bank into the scandal. Uh, so in some levels, P2 was definitely a key player in that. Calvia's death, uh, his body being found at Blackfriars Bridge, I think strongly indicates that P2 was who was behind his uh, mysterious death. Yeah, you know, and it's funny too, when you read the Wikipedia entry for the Vatican banking scandal, and when you read the Wikipedia entry for Liceo Gelli, they describe the P2 Lodge in different ways. On the Vatican banking scandal page, P2 is called a bogus Masonic Lodge, but on the Gelli page, it's described as a clandestine Masonic Lodge. So, a bit of a discrepancy there. What say you, though? I mean, was it bogus or was it clandestine? 
Well, I think it was, I mean, kind of a combination of both, really. I mean, it, I mean, it obviously was not a mainline Masonic Lodge, uh, but it was also a very clandestine operation, and I mean, it effectively was kind of a front for the Italian deep state for, you know, many years, especially in the 70s and the 80s, uh, and obviously there was some kind of occult doctrine that seems to have been practiced by P2, but um, as I've you know, noted earlier, I really don't think that it had anything to do with mainline uh, Freemasonry. Yeah, so in your blogs, too, you also mentioned that Gelly traveled in the same circles as people linked to the Kennedy assassination. Who are you referring to exactly? Well, that's uh, actually interesting. It's not so much an individual as it was an organization that either Gelly or one of his associates were involved with. I haven't been able to determine yet in my research, but that organization uh, would be one that I've recently dealt with, known as Permandex. Permandex turned up in the Kennedy assassination, uh, and by the way, Permandex stands for Permanent Industrial Expositions. It ran various trademarks across the world, specifically one in New Orleans, and the individual who was very closely associated with the New Orleans trademark was none other than Clay Shaw, who Jim Garrison eventually brought charges against in his investigation into the Kennedy assassination. And then I should also go ahead and mention, too, Shaw also was very active in Italy uh, in the 1970s when P2 was really starting to rise to prominence. Uh, in Italy, uh, he was involved with the World Trade Center, which um, in Italian, I believe, was uh, referred to as Centro Mandela Commerciale, which was based in Rome, and uh, Shaw was apparently very active there on and off throughout uh, the late 60s. But um, the connection to Permandex is really interesting. As, I've, as I noted before, I have been dealing with it recently, and uh, that is in relation to another alleged member of Permandex who uh, was none other than Roy Kuhn, Donald Trump's longtime attorney and political mentor, which I also found to be very interesting. In general, I think Permandex was really uh, at the forefront of this kind of black network that we've been discussing that P2 was a part of. Permandex, of course, was, I believe, founded initially in Canada in the 19th 50s by Lewis Bloomfield, and it uh, ended up with all shoots all across the world. And I mean, the listing of it was just a rogues gallery of various, you know, right wing figures with extensive intelligence ties. Is it a stretch then to also tie P2 and the Knights of Malta to the JFK assassination? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, P2, I don't really know how much. I mean, you could really say that the involvement was there because, I mean, P2 really didn't get off the ground until several years after the Kennedy assassination. But um, as I've written before, there also were a fair amount of Knights of Malta who appear to have been involved in the JFK assassination. And again, I mean, the connection to Permandex, I think, is also, I mean, most telling as well. But yes, I mean, this seems to have been the same network. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it probably grew out of the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, which radicalized various members of the American right-wing faction, if you will, and that really set off the, set the trajectory for this sort of rogue, I guess, network, or maybe not necessarily rogue, but by uh, but this, I guess you would say, kind of far right-wing black network that has an international reach. Wasn't it Gelly's home that was raided in the early 80s and they, the authorities found the actual P2 member list? Yes, yes, yes. The uh, his villa and um, that was near Florence, as I had to mention before, which is exactly where they found the member list. Yes, Arezio. And yeah, Tuscany. and yeah, I was gonna say they found a lot of like law enforcement officials, Vatican officials, local politicians. Right? I mean, th there was just like a who's who of Italian politicians and religious officials on this list, which is you know quite curious. I don't know what came out of that raid, though. Did anything happen? Well, a lot of the information was suppressed, and I would speculate because it was most likely um, blackmail material. And I mean, again, that really goes in again to some of the allegations surrounding Roy Kuhn, uh, who, as I just noted, was a part of that Permandex network. Uh, Kuhn, of course, has been speculated to have really specialized in sexual blackmail specifically uh, for a lot of years, and that's a topic that I'm going to be writing on in depth uh, in the near future on my blog. But Kuhn definitely... Some of his associates 
turn up in some very curious places. Probably the most notorious one that I've kind of hinted at so far was Craig Spence, who ran a escort service uh, out of Washington in the late 80s for prominent homosexuals in many cases, and who was also reputed to have uh, ran underage children in this network as well. And he was, of course, a friend of Larry King, who uh, was at the center of the Franklin scandal in Nebraska. So, I mean, you can kind of see outlines of this international network uh, stretching across multiple continents. And, you know, I would guess that the information that uh, was recovered in Gelly's villa was probably on par with the type of network or the type of information that Kuhn had been searching for in the United States. Probably many compromising documents that could be used to blackmail politicians and other, you know, prominent uh, captains of industry and what have you to ensure that certain agendas are implemented. Definitely, yeah. So P2, obviously, based on, you know, essentially their geography, and we touched on it too, they're they're intimately linked to the Vatican, uh, as one might expect. But there was a prohibition against the clergy being initiated into Freemasonry until the early 80s. Funny timing there. But even before then, you noted that the P2 Lodge claimed a lot of Vatican insiders as members, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had definitely begun even before the uh, prohibitions on masonry or being involved in masonry were lifted in the early 80s. But as I kind of stated earlier, I mean, the Knights of Malta had been involved in Masonic lodges, I think, since at least the 17th century. So the, the prohibitions had never really deterred them that uh, that much to begin with. Yeah, and I mentioned the funny timing because Gelly's home is raided in 1981, and that's when this P2 member list is discovered. Not necessarily made public, I think some of it was, but definitely it was found. And then that prohibition <laughs> against the clergy from being initiated into Freemasonry ends shortly thereafter. So that, that is curious timing, at least to me. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, definitely. It seemed like Gelly had maybe <sighs> displeased some of his backers at that point. It possibly gotten a little too greedy, but uh, on the flip side of the coin, the Vatican had a lot of exposure to this, and they wanted to make sure that their bases were covered, and lifting the prohibitions on being a, Maso- a member of a Freemasonic Lodge would have definitely helped avoid certain scandals from developing when some of those names started to come out. Yeah, and there's also... You know, right around this time, too, it was actually uh, a couple years before this, which this may have more to do with the prohibition against Freemasonry being lifted, but there's some great theories about the death of Pope John Paul I in 1978. What do you know about that event, and how might, you know, P2 or some of these other clandestine orders been involved? Well, there was definitely, I mean, a lot of speculation uh, that there was something strange about that. I mean, certainly the Pope died after um, only 33 days in office, which clearly has a lot of Masonic significance to it. The general thought is that he may have potentially been uh, poisoned by a member of the papal household staff and that the parties had been supported in this endeavor by some combination of P2, the Knights of Malta, and Opus Die. Was it him or was it Pope John Paul II that I think, does one of them have the, the nickname of the last pope? Not sure exactly which one that would have been. Some people, I think, though, did believe that uh, John Paul I had been the last pope because effectively, uh, I mean, there was obviously a lot of speculation that the death of John Paul I was sort of a stealth coup in which uh, this one kind of radical faction came to power under the uh, influence of Pope John Paul II, who was very close to both Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta, and also uh, who had really gone against the chief adversary of these two orders, the Jesuits in the early 1980s. So that's interesting. Yeah, I guess the Jesuits are conspicuous by their absence in this story to this point. I'm glad you brought them up. I, didn't, I don't have any notes on them, but since you brought them up, what is their connection here? Because when you get into conspiracy research, they're always one of those groups that pops up as like, oh, you know, like these are puppet masters on some level. They're the real sort of power behind the throne. But you didn't mention them, I think, at all in the three blogs that we're covering here. So, and you just mentioned that they're sort of enemies of the groups we are talking about. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Jesuits had really ran afoul of the uh, Knights of Malta and Opus Dei and many of the more conservative Catholic orders in the 60s with the very tentative promotion that they gave to the notion of liberation theology, which is, of course, the source of a lot of uh, conspiracy theories by many right-wing researchers over the years. By the early 80s, this rivalry had really gone into overdrive, and essentially Opus Dei 
had pressured Pope John Paul II to remove the head of the Jesuits and replace him with someone who would be more receptive to the ideology that was being promoted by their rivals in Opus Dei and the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. And it's rather interesting because now Pope Francis, who is himself a Jesuit, is essentially doing the same thing to the Knights of Malta. He recently removed their Grand Master and is in the process of trying to put someone in control of the order that will presumably be less uh, radical than what the Grand Masters of the past have typically been. You know, I guess the the whole point of this is these groups, uh, P2, especially here that we've been talking about for the last few minutes, uh, they have quite the reputation. Uh, and in terms of P2, you know, you mentioned they were linked to Operation Gladio. We mentioned the Vatican banking scandal. We mentioned the, the death of Pope John Paul I. We didn't mention the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II. Is there anything to say about that? That's kind of an interesting topic, too. Of course, there was a lot of effort made uh, by some of these, you know, allied groups to try to pin that on the Soviets. And it does seem like, to some extent, Gelly had used his connections to the Eastern Bloc, especially Bulgaria, to potentially bring in weapons and maybe a few patsies to enhance that connection. But uh, certainly, I mean, it is a very interesting event, and uh, it's a little curious on the surface because, I mean, Pope John Paul II was very close to Opus Dei. So it's a little surprising that they would have tried to sponsor an assassination for him uh, very early in his tenure. But, I mean, who's to say what exactly, you know, was going on behind the scenes? Possibly uh, the second John Paul might have realized the true extent of the wretchedness of the individuals he had thrown in with and was possibly considering some alternatives. Let's just say I don't really know the case, but, yes, it was another uh, deep event in Italy that seems to have very much involved the forces behind P2. Yeah, and you also mentioned the years of lead, which was a long period of, I guess, what we would just call terrorism that destabilized Italy throughout the 1970s. Is there anything more to say about that? Well, I mean, not really beyond what we've already, I mean, said before. I mean, essentially, it seems like, you know, this was a process that P2 was kind of overseeing uh, for the U.S. intelligence community to destabilize Italy at a time when it looked like there was a strong possibility that the Communist Party in Italy would be democratically elected. This was especially true in the 1970s. This process had really gotten to a head with the possible election of, um, oh, what is his name, Olado Moro, I believe, uh, in 1976, and he had uh, threatened about possibly bringing the communists into a coalition government, and shortly thereafter, he was abducted by what was at the time believed to have been members of the Red Brigade. But uh, this story, as many people over the years have pointed out, didn't really hold up, especially since the individuals who carried out the abduction were mostly described as middle-aged men in their 40s, uh, where the Red Brigade was primarily made up of college students. So anyway, you know, this uh, abduction happens. Eventually, he's killed while he's in captivity, and that really poisoned the public perception of the Communist Party in Italy after it appeared that they had essentially kidnapped the prime minister shortly before they were on the verge of coming to power, which really doesn't make a lot of sense, but this is what the public was told, and, you know, it very much changed the trajectory that Italy was going on at the time. So, I mean, certainly P2 played, you know, a very prominent role in a lot of these kind of uh, deep state intrigues that were happening in Italy at the time. And, I mean, it was very crucial to the United States, you know, to ensure that Italy stayed within the Allied bloc. I mean, if they were to even become neutral in the Cold War and potentially expel U.S. military forces from Italy, it could have been very devastating because Italy was the chief southern kind of port area for Europe at the time. Yeah, man. So all these events, which we just mentioned, this is quite the resume for this group and uh, the groups affiliated with them. There are a couple other things that we could talk about. You know, P2 is also linked to Latin American death squads and international drug trafficking. The drug trafficking thing, you've sort of expanded on in some other series, so we don't have to touch on that necessarily right now. But what about these Latin American death squads? I think you mentioned, you know, Argentina earlier. Is that the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, Gelli was very uh, close to the uh, generals that had come to power in the coup in the late 70s, which had led to the uh, what's usually referred to as the Dirty Wars in Argentina. So, yes, I mean, Gelli was very close to this network. And then, of course, the Argentinian secret services were major players in what is known as Operation Condor, which was essentially a South American-wide, or actually, really, you could say it encompassed the entire Americas, as there were several terror attacks carried out in the United States by these 
group. But essentially, it was a terror network that stretched across the Americas that uh, especially involved Argentina, Chile, and a few of the other allied countries in the Southern Hemisphere. And essentially, you know, they would collaborate together in assassinating or kidnapping political adversaries in other countries. Uh, one of the most notorious aspects of Condor was probably uh, Colonia Dignidad, the Dignity Colony in Chile, where uh, Pinochet had frequently disappeared his political prisoners to, and there have been reports that have come out now that many other opponents of, you know, the Argentinian government and some of the other ones were also shipped there and tortured by uh, former Nazi war criminals in many cases. I mean, this was a very elaborate network, and Gelly was plugged into it via his contacts in the Argentinian secret services. And then, of course, there's the uh, notorious uh, Italian terrorist, I believe his name is pronounced uh, Stefano Del Chelsea, who was also extensively involved in Operation Condor. He also had ties to P2 in Europe and some of these other terror networks, such as the Gentry Press in Spain. So definitely, I mean, we're dealing with a vast international network that was involved in heavy amounts of terrorism in both Europe and the Americas throughout the Cold War. That brings us to the end of the three blogs that we wanted to cover this time. You know, I guess I just have a couple random questions now, if you don't mind. Like, I think the first one is, are these groups still active today? Is, is P2 still a thing? I mean, obviously, P2, I think, was pretty thoroughly shut down. But, I mean, yes, I do think the descendants of these groups are still very much active. And, I mean, in a lot of ways, you can see the... Uh, their rise in power most evidently in uh, the United States and Britain with the elect election of Donald Trump in the U.S. and uh, free exit in the U.K. Those two events have really uh, were influenced, I would say, heavily by this right-wing faction that P2 was a part of. In the case of... Uh, the UK and Brie exit, a lot of the backing for this really came from the British members of Le Cercle, uh, who have actually become among the most prominent Eurosceptics in the continent of late. And as I touched on before, Donald Trump really owes a lot of his career to Roy Kuhn, who was, you know, very much plugged into this network. As I, you know, had noted earlier, Kuhn was, a, was probably a part of Permandex, along with individuals like Gelly and Clay Shaw and what have you. So, I mean, you can kind of draw connections, I mean, to a host of intrigues, the Bay of Pigs, the, the assassination, possibly the assassination of RFK. I mean, some of the events we've been talking about in Italy and what have you that are all connected to this group, which still seems to wield, I mean, a tremendous amount of power. I guess the last question then that I have for you is, how the hell do you do all this research? Like, where do you find all this? Well, I mean, I've certainly spent a rather considerable amount of money on uh, my library, which is extremely extensive now. It's just really, I mean, a lot of copious reading in a lot of cases through dry biographies and what have you, where you kind of turn up a lot of these interesting details and what have you. And then, of course, Internet sleuthing and that type of thing. But, uh, I mean, I seem to have always had a knack, though, for kind of remembering a lot of these interesting associations. And when you start digging into these topics, as we sort of touched upon before, um, you know, when you start researching some of these projects, you think that they're only going to be a few, you know, maybe one or two blogs long, and then they turn into five or six. And a lot of that just stems from uncovering different connections that I was unaware of when I started the project. And that brings me up to other topics that I had already covered before. And suddenly I'm like, wow, there's, you know, a considerable amount of overlap between these two subjects. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, just for the listeners, like this is, this is just an introduction to what we wanted to talk about. And, you know, we've sort of tentatively agreed to doing a series of, of podcasts here that cover some of this material more in depth. But I really wanted to just lay the groundwork with some history of the groups that, that we're talking about and what they're into. And this, to me, has been pretty interesting. But the stuff that we hit, that we left on the table that we will talk about later is even more interesting. And it does bring us up to modern day, too. So I guess just then... Based on what we have talked about for the last, you know, hour plus, did we miss anything? Is there anything else worth throwing out there? Oh, well, I mean, I think we've hit most of the topics here as a good introduction to it. It's something that's kind of fun, I suppose, that we could talk about here for a second. But uh, I've really kind of started to think of this group in a lot of ways as a sort of real-life version of uh, Spectra, which was the name of the organization that were antagonists and uh a lot of the James Bond movies. Spectra, of course, originated from the novels written by Ian Fleming, who 
you know, he had, of course, many ties to the British Secret Services, but Spectre was not especially prominent in many of the novels. I think they only appeared in three or four and only in two in really a significant role, but uh, they were very significant in the movies. And one in particular that I've really become obsessed with of late is uh, Diamonds Are Forever, which was uh, Sean Connery's last turn as James Bond until... Um, I believe Never Say Never Again in 1983 or something to that effect. But um, Diamonds is just really a mind-blowing movie, especially when you consider that it was made in 1971. But uh, it has allusions to the kidnapping of Howard Hughes. Uh, It has allusions to the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. It has allusions to Area 51, to... um, the staging of the moon landing and a host of other things. And of course, uh, it really depicts this uh, Spectra organization as being based heavily in Las Vegas, which is something that I think a lot of us, uh, most notably Chris Nolas, have really picked up on as being uh, a major center of power in the 21st century. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, Vegas might be the actual headquarters for this network that we've been discussing for the last hour or so, at least in the uh, in current manifestation. Yeah, Vegas, you know, has an interesting history, obviously, intimately tied to the to the mob, which has ties to all the groups that we've been talking about, or maybe not all of them, but definitely some of them. And uh, that will be a focus uh, of some future episodes here for sure. So, Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just the syndicate ties to a lot of this are also very mm-hmm. curious. But, yeah, as I've kind of said, I mean, if uh, to kind of give your readers an idea, if you want to see kind of my thinking of how some of this might work out, I mean, Diamonds Are Forever does sort of provide a, a very interesting take on this sort of network. I definitely feel like, in hindsight, it was very much a limited hangout, especially when you kind of consider some of the topics that were hinted at in it, such as Area 50. I mean, Area 51 really didn't gain a lot of traction in conspiratorial circles and certainly not in pop culture lexicons until the late 80s, early 90s. And I mean, it was already being depicted, I mean, in Diamonds in the early 70s. So it definitely makes, I think, for some interesting viewing and uh, I think kind of provides a preview maybe with some of the things that are now currently unfolding in the world today. Definitely, man, definitely. Well, I think that's a good note to end this particular chat on, so please do tell people where they can find the blog if they want more of this. The blog can be found at visupview, V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W dot blogspot dot com. Definitely, and we will link uh, to the appropriate blog entries that we've covered here in this particular episode with plenty more coming, hopefully, if you're up for it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being here. This is pretty important work, and hopefully, you know, we don't get too much shit for this uh, from listeners or from, you know, any other clandestine operations out there. (laughs) Absolutely. Again, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here, and I will talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, man. And there you have it. My thanks again to Recluse for dropping by to lay the foundation for what I hope will be a shadowy but ultimately enlightening series of shows based on these groups, their various affiliations and overlaps, and their modus operandi. Now the thing about this series is, I really want to share this information with everybody, but based on the nature of it, I may continue it on Patreon exclusively. I haven't decided that for sure, and Recluse and I haven't even set a date to record part 2 of the series. But you can tell by the nature of the information here, it's pretty sensitive, pretty controversial, and it's something that, you know, it may bring about some unwanted attention. Because this is a story that, while it does tackle history in the past, it also very much brings us up to modern day and highlights what very well could be a hidden epicenter of political power that, I think, isn't explored enough. It's all pretty timely if you've been paying attention to what's been happening in Italy recently, too. I will say that my entry point into this story was the Knights of Malta's interest in alchemy. There's some fascinating tales about that. Whether they're true or not, I'm not sure, but it's definitely thought-provoking material, and as you will with rabbit holes, and as you will with occult research, I kept going and fell into Recluse's blogs, which did touch on the group's alchemical interests, but took it several steps further as you heard, and revealed a ton of hidden history that I knew nothing about. It's the nexus of true crime, conspiracy, and the occult, and the best way to ensure you don't miss the next installment of this Dark Knights series, regardless of where it lands, is to sign up for that Patreon at patreon.com slash occulture. Four levels of support starting at just two bucks a month. Two bucks, that's it, just two bucks. 
Some shout-outs are in order to my thanks to Russell, Jake, and Jocelyn for signing up on Patreon recently. Thanks to my friend Mike for also hopping on board. It's about fucking time, man. And a special shout-out to Matt and, and I'm sorry, but I will definitely butcher this name, Sysakthia? Holy shit, I'm sorry. But both of them recently became official executive producers of the show, so gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Thank you so much. We also just crossed the 50% mark toward our first goal on Patreon, so that's kind of cool. A lot more to do to accomplish the ultimate goal and complete this great work, which means I have to get back in the laboratory and keep trying to find that elixir that eludes most everybody. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,